Welcome back to Just Chatting, and this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings for our own amusement. So, for all you Audi fans, I'm afraid he's not going to be in here with us for the video. He is outside, sleeping on the trash toter, very publicly. He does this, not just my trash toter, he sleeps on all the neighbors' trash toters. He does this to humiliate me. He does this to make a statement to the neighborhood that he is a poor, forlorn, trash-sleeping cat. I don't know what he expects them to do about it, but I strongly suspect that there's, like, treats for a cat in there somewhere. So, he's having a good time. I'm going to leave him be. If he comes back, or if he wants to come back, before the video is over. I will bring them in, and we will have some audio time. In the meanwhile, you've seen the pictures. Your guess is as good as mine. All right. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, a lot of little stuff, because strange little rumors have been cropping around, and essentially the free fall of the Sussex Media Empire. So, when we come back. Let's start with Nutmeg's popularity. I know nobody in the world is as obsessed with that as Nutmeg herself. And unfortunately for her, her popularity in the UK is down to negative 47 at this point. Uh, Harry's is at negative 35, so he's really not doing that much better than she is. The article that uh, gave this information did not do what they usually do, which is give a comparison to Andrew. If Andrew is still where he was in the polls six months ago, this drops them below Andrew. Uh, although I have to say, too, I think if that was the case, they might have mentioned it in the article. So I'm not sure. Perhaps Andrew's numbers have dropped as well. But, yeah, we, we are no longer where we once were when everybody had royal wedding fever. What was that, five years ago? So I would have to say it doesn't come as a surprise to me. I don't imagine it comes as very much of a surprise to any of our British viewers. But... It's nice to see that they are still releasing the figures. I was afraid if she dropped too low in the polls, they would simply stop issuing the numbers, which is, that has been something that has been done in the past. When the numbers get a little too wonky, uh, generally they will hold them back for a while. But nope, I guess nobody is out to protect Nutmeg's highly tarnished reputation. So, next up, and now this last one was a fact, that is from polling. This next one is more of a rumor, and this is from Tom Bauer. And uh, Tom Bauer has apparently gone on record saying that he believes Nutmeg and the Sock Puppet are going to change their names from Mountbatten, Windsor to Spencer. So let's talk a little bit about the names. Spencer, as we all know, was Diana's family name. And Bauer claims this is part of their obsessive linking with Diana. In that sense, it does not surprise me in the least. I mean, the only thing that has surprised me about those two and their Diana obsession is that they haven't dug the poor woman out of her grave and brought her home to Montecito with them because they they have been 
beyond excessive. They, their Diana obsession is starting to look like a psychological illness. But I don't have to live with them, so what do I care? Mountbatten Windsor, as the royal family name, was taken on when Elizabeth married Philip. She was a Windsor, he was Mountbatten. Now, the Mountbatten name had been Battenberg, and it was anglicized to Mountbatten in the 20th century. So it's not a name of long standing. And in fact, it's, well, anglicized, it's, it's a made up name. Uh, the family took Battenberg and decided Mountbatten was a nice version of it. They probably could have picked a name out of a hat and it would have had no more significance to them as a family. But be that as it may, it was a very big deal to Philip that his children have his name. And when the British government was discussing the issue, Philip rather famously said, I will be the only man in the kingdom who can't give his children his name. Uh, I have strong, strong feelings about that because I don't see any reason in the world why a child should automatically have a father's name instead of a mother's name. It seems inherently very, very sexist to me. But, you know, not my game, not my rules. I think the reason Philip was especially disturbed about this is because his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, was disturbed about this. Now, Louis Mountbatten, the British like him very much. I have some serious issues with this guy. Maybe I'll do a video one of these days exploring some of the issues I have with the fellow. But Philip was fond of him. Charles was beyond fond of him. Louis Mountbatten was probably one of the chief influences in Charles's life. And if Harry gives up the Mountbatten name, I have a strong feeling that will not go over well with Charles. Now, we know how important uh, Lord Mountbatten was to the entire family from the fact that William and Catherine named their youngest after him. Yes, that's how the name Louis came into the family. So, are they going to become Harry and Meghan Spencer as opposed to Harry and Meghan Mountbatten Windsor? I think, basically, who cares? Nutmeg is still known as Meghan Markle. Harry has been known as Prince Harry, not Prince Henry or Henry Mountbatten Windsor. It's a name that's very detached from their daily lives. And they're simply not using the name one way or the other. Yes, the children have the names and allegedly it is on their alleged little birth certificates. But would this be the sort of family upset that would happen if this took place in in an ordinary family that used that name, used the family name every day. I don't think so. So on that hand, I think that, yeah, they might be considering doing it. But there's more than this to the rumor. The rumor is that when they become Harry and Meghan Spencer, they are going to give up their titles, uh, Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Well, here's my thought on this speculative, but then again, all of this is speculation. The first part is Tom Bauer's speculation. This one is mine. If they do give up the Mountbatten Windsor name, I think their desire to give up the titles of Duke and Duchess of Sussex will be moot because I think Charles will take it from them. I do not think he would allow his son to write him off like that. Because remember, the name comes from Charles. It is his father's name, his mother's name. And if what Harry does is disowns Elizabeth and Philip and throws his hat into the Spencer camp instead. And remember, these folks are not too fond of nutmeg. 
I, I think that will make some decisions for Charles. I think it will push him to a point where he will have to pull the titles. Uh, I believe that will make Camilla very happy. I don't see William and Catherine complaining. In fact, I don't see anyone other than Meg and Ginger complaining if those titles get pulled. I think if they did this, Charles would feel, rightly or wrongly, that he had nowhere to go. That if his son disowns him, he's going to have to do, do it lock, stock, and barrel. You know, disown the family, disown the titles. So, I find that exceptionally interesting. Now, the reasons I think this might actually be a thing, ordinarily I would scoff at this and say, well, this is an absurd rumor, but there are some good reasons to believe there might be some credibility. One, their very, very obvious obsession with Diana. That should be abundantly clear. Nutmeg has proven already that she will dis disown a name if she doesn't like the sound of it. Remember when they spoke about the putative child Archie being the Earl of Dumbarton and her response was, nobody's calling my ba baby uh, the Earl of Dumb anything. She didn't like the name. She just it took that name apart in, in probably the least flattering way she could without ever having considered the idea of naming what, what was ostensibly, and I say ostensibly because I'm not sure about this, ostensibly a little red-headed freckled child, Archie. That didn't bother her a bit, though, did it? But would she rather have a name like Spencer than Mountbatten Windsor? Oh, I would think, yeah. She's already shown us that these names need to be Hollywood names. They need to trip off the top. So I think that is probably one of the best arguments in favor of the credibility of this rumor. There are other things, too, though. She wouldn't really be giving up a name. She doesn't use Meghan Mountbatten Windsor. She uses Meghan Markle. Everyone calls her that. She calls herself the Duchess of Sussex and Meghan Markle. And her fans call her Princess Henry. I think the bottom line is it wouldn't impact her very much one way or the other. So all she would need would be a slight preference to tip the scales. That seems to me to be the best argument in favor of this rumor being a reality. So I guess we'll have to see. All right, so those are the couple of, well, entertaining little bits of news fluff. But the big story, of course, is the Arch, Archwell, Archiewell. I'm going to stick with Archiewell, I think. The Archiewell media empire crumbling. And as I said before, it's crumbling is not even accurate. It's in free fall. Uh, so let's just cast back a little and see what was wrapped up in this media empire. Uh, and this is Archiewell Productions, as opposed to Archiewell whatever else. And I do believe they have at least 11 businesses incorporated under that, that umbrella. So the media produced uh, two books. And there were two book publishing contracts. One was the bench. We're not going to spend too much time talking about the bench because I'm saving that. One of these days when those two Montecito morons shut up for long enough and stop giving me other topics to focus on, I am going to shred that book for you folks because as an educator and that being a child's book, 
this is right squarely in my wheelhouse. And I will tell you, as an educator, I find that book appalling. And if I saw that in a classroom, I would seriously question the, the intelligence of the teacher bringing the book in seriously. So let's move away from that. Then there was Spare. And now these are the first two books of what was allegedly a four-book deal. A piece of trash aimed at, who knows, small children perhaps? It reads like it was written by a small child, so yeah, maybe. And then Spare, and remember, the sock puppet claims he has just as much information that was left out of Spare. So he could do a whole new book. And this was nothing but trashing the royal family and the sock puppet attempting to sell the world on the bizarre notion that he is an intelligent, capable human being. Well, I don't think anybody bought into that. And certainly the only thing people took away from it was the trash talk about the royal family. So I would have to say that one no. And then we had a couple of um, podcasts. Remember the first podcast? That was the one, uh, what was it, in late 2020, I believe, that was beaten out in the ratings by Whale Song. Yeah, memorable, wasn't it? And then we had Archie Types. Now, of course, Archie Types was allegedly... Uh, a number one podcast for Spotify, but many, many people, I am not the only person, I just, I hasten to say that, many, many people have questioned the numbers and how they juked the stats to come up with this notion that that podcast beat out Joe Rogan week after week. No, it didn't happen. They did play with the statistics. They played with the numbers. And we know this. So was it a smash hit? No. Did it win awards? Well, Nutmeg is perfectly capable of buying herself awards. Most of the awards out there, by the way, of any sort, are ultimately for sale. You see this all the time. Awards routinely go to donors of the organization, giving out the awards, or to people selected by major donors of those organizations. Awards, awards are nowhere near as objective as most of us wish to think they are. So that Archie Types podcast and its pseudo awards, oh really? No. The viewership they did get and remember, we have the comparison when it was just not Meg and Ginger. Whale Song beat it out. This time around with Archie types, there were people like Paris Hilton and Mariah Carey and uh, Mindy Kaling, um, Serena Williams. I suspect, can't prove this, but let's just use our common sense. I suspect a great many people watched Archetypes for the people that Nutmeg brought into the show. And I'm not even sure she brought them in. Many other people were involved in this. And Nutmeg certainly did ask Taylor Swift to do it. And apparently Taylor allowed her staff to politely decline on her behalf. Yeah, that's the difference between an A-list celebrity and a D-list celebrity. You know, so I, I hope Nutmeg absorbed that lesson. She was clearly going out of her way to get the biggest name she could. And it's interesting because, of course, she didn't much care what they had to say. Everything was about her. It was all about her. And that's the common theme in whatever Archie Well Productions has put out. It is about Nutmeg and Ginger. That's all. And 
nobody is really interested in listening to those two spoiled, entitled brats screaming, me, 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 all day long. I mean, remember this little piggy went to market? It's like me, me, me all the way home. That's what always comes to mind when I think of those two. So when we start to look at this podcast, Archie Types, and we remember what a podcast with nothing but nutmeg and ginger in it did, then it seems pretty clear to me that most of the viewership was based on the big name guest stars they were able to suck into this. And that's pretty much the end of it. Now, Netflix and the Harry and Meghan docudrama, which I am now declaring to be a propaganda film based on what the producers have said, that did have a viewership, which was higher in the beginning than at the end. And that's normal, by the way, so I can't say it's people listened to them and got sick of it. it I, I imagine for most people it wasn't the way it was in my house, because when I was playing that without my earbuds, my cat was distraught. He hates Nutmeg's voice for some reason. He cannot stand it. It's just really unsettling to him. So when I was playing that, I would have to put in earbuds or the cat would wail. So I don't know if it was that way for most people, but that's what it was like in my house. Watching that mockumentary was an ordeal. It was a struggle because of the cat. But that one, again, was a propaganda piece and it was shredded by virtually everybody. Uh, what is happening now is the entire timetable on that was displayed in that Netflix program is being systematically dissected. And what will happen is in a few months when people are through with the dissection and the unraveling, because anything that comes from nutmeg is going to be wrapped up like a Gordian knot. You know, it's like, you've got to really tease it apart. It's becoming very clear that much of it, possibly even most of it, was sheer fabrication. Even things that were presented as factual um, representations of what was going on allegedly at the time, they are coming undone. So I don't even know how anybody can call it a documentary at this point, because a documentary should be factual. There should be some attempt to get the other side when you are presenting facts. None, none there. This was nothing but a puff piece for nutmeg and ginger. And even people who might not have realized that at the time are seeing it now. So the Spotify contract has been dropped, and I totally get that. They did not produce the content they were supposed to produce. And Spotify, Spotify pumped an awful lot of money into contracting with Nutmeg and the Sock Puppet. And given their financial situation and the fact that they have let so many people go, it's pretty clear that money really needed to be allocated elsewhere. So yeah, it was a loss for them. Netflix, really, who knows? But one of the interesting things to come out of this as they are in free fall is people are releasing the information on projects that they had thrown out there that were rejected by Spotify, by Netflix, by whoever. Here's my favorite. Apparently the sock puppet, keep in mind, this is not an intelligent, well-educated man. That is so important here. The sock puppet wanted to interview people, famous people, about their childhood traumas, 
Why? Because he and his wife are so freaking self-referential. The only thing they can deal with is their own lives and their own traumas. And the sock puppet's entire identity is wrapped around the, the unsurvivable trauma of losing a parent at an early age. Hey, join the club, pal. I've been there. Many others have been there. And we've survived. Get over it. It's been 25 years. That's all I have to say about that. Well, one of the people he wanted to interview is Vladimir Putin. Now, I don't know how much you folks know about Vladimir Putin, but I'm going to give you the haiku version of Putin's life. So let's start with the fact that his family came from Leningrad. And he is my age. Actually, he's a year older than I am, I think. My age. Cold War baby. All right. So, Leningrad. And his parents had two children before he was born. The first child was born in the 1930s and died in infancy. No one knows why. No one cares why. This was the Soviet Union in the 1930s. People died all the time. Conditions there, although the, the outside world didn't realize it, conditions there were bad. But it gets better. Oh, it gets so much better. Then his parents rather optimistically have a second child in 1940. Remember where they lived? Leningrad. So two years later, their baby starved to death in the siege of Leningrad. The siege of Leningrad in, in a war full of horrific atrocities. The siege of Leningrad, I would put it up there with maybe the top three. I might put it at number one. This is, it's, it's so not family friendly. We're just not going to talk about it. But those of you with any idea of what went on in World War II, will know what it means. They were in hell on earth. That's how their second child died. Then, there, oh, by the way, um, Putin's father was so badly wounded on the Eastern Front that he was declared unfit for continued military duty in the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Now, Soviet Union, Second World War, if you had a pulse, you were fit for military duty. So, Papa Putin, Lord only knows what happened to him, but he did not come back in one piece. So, ten years later, they decide they're going to start again, bless their hearts. And they have little Vlad. Can you imagine what kind of life he had as a child, let me show you a picture of him when he was five. Actually, this should probably give you some idea of what his life was like. The trauma of his parents' lives up to that point, the death of the two previous children, there's no way that could not have impacted his life. This is a person who breathed trauma. Fact is, this is... A man who knows misery. He was born into a family that had survived one of the worst experiences of the war. They had lost two children. Imagine having your child starve to death in front of you. This is just unbelievable. And then Putin grows up, he gets himself an education, and I mean, he got himself an education. He's got a doctorate in economics, I believe. So, this man's no fool. And he goes into the KGB. So, what we have is a world leader who is a former Cold War KGB agent. There's no telling how much English Putin speaks. He rarely speaks English. The Kremlin says he speaks very good English, but the problem is anyone who was in the KGB is going to have so much of their past history 
redacted. So many of their skills and accomplishments are just going to be swept under the rug because it was the KGB, for heaven's sake. So Harry was proposing to go to the, the I almost said the Soviet Union, that's what I grew up with, the Soviet Union, proposing to go to Russia, interview a former KGB agent who has more education than Harry could hope to attain if he spent the rest of his life, you know, in grade school, frankly. A man who can think rings around him, and Harry was going to sit down with this man and say, let's talk childhood trauma. My mother died. If it wasn't Harry, if it was anybody else, it would be unbelievable. But yeah, it's Harry. So it's just plain laughable. And that's the one I liked the most. What on earth was he thinking when he threw this out? I, but it shows you a couple of things. It shows you how very self-referential they both are. They cannot step outside of themselves and their own experiences. It's all about them always. And it also shows you how absolutely unaware they are of anyone or anything else in the world. Harry's trauma was significant. He lost his mother. The media killed her, etc., etc. That is important. Vladimir Putin's family surviving the siege of Leningrad. Hey, what's that compared to his mother dying? I thought it was just remarkably enlightening. But I'm running out of time. I don't want this to get too long. So this is where I'm going to sign off. I may pick up on this next time. We'll see. But yeah, the media empire is crumbling. It is crashing and burning. It is just, uh, it's coming down, you know, like a comet in the night. We can see the sparks and fire. So I will see you all next time. In the meantime, have a terrific day.